Hello, I'm Chuck, and um, yeah, I. Uh, so my journey is uh, quite interesting. So right now, I am a uh, developer advocate for JetBrains. Um, but before, actually, how I started my tech career is that I was a data scientist. And um, I only started actually uh, when I moved to UK. So before, I didn't actually study any like data science or you know computer science or anything like that. I was studying physics. Um, but during my research year, I did some you know um, computational research. So I have to um, you know do some calculation <laughs> with computers. So um, when I moved to UK, I get this opportunity to. Um, you know, to do an online course and learn data science. And then after that, you know, that's just kind of, um, you know, I, I started a career in tech, which is for me, um, it's not a surprise because I have always been a nerdy kid. So um, yeah, and then I fell in love with open source. Um, so I have a lot of tools that I use at work, you know, Pandas and Scikit-learn, all those tools that a lot of data scientists use. And um, then I want to see how I can give back uh, to those you know, open source and the community. So that's why I get involved in, um, you know, being a Python developer and um, later, you know, becoming a developer advocate. Yeah. Yeah. So my inspiration actually, um, I don't know if I actually have a goal to, uh, to transition, but um, during the time working as a data scientist, I got really involved with the community. I go to a lot of meetups and then go to speak at a lot of conferences and at some point that I was thinking, how can I do more of that? And, you know, be not being told by my manager that you have been to too many conferences. Um, I also met some friends during, uh, you know, at the conference that they are developer advocates. So kind of, you know, that kind of clicked a little bit, you know, I was like, oh, maybe that is my, you know, my ticket to go to more conference. Um, but that was quite natural because I, I was already doing um, what most developer advocates doing. I was speaking at conferences, I was writing blog posts. So um, I think that's something that kind of, you know, already prepared me for my journey in this um, role. Yeah, I think there is a huge overlap between developer advocacy and education. So, um, you know, when you are going out to give talks, to um, show people like how things can be done, a lot of time is also you are giving a message, right? Especially for AI right now, is there's a lot of hype uh, about AI, everybody's talking about it, but how much of it is true and how, what the, what is the right attitude towards it? Could could be, you know, um, could be kind of um, hiding behind all these like amazing things, you know, a lot of flashy, you know, demonstration, oh, this is really cool, but what actually is going on? I think um, that may be overlooked by some people. So for me, I feel that my job, part of my job is to educate other people and you know and also I want people to be AI uh, ready right? because you know it, it seems that it's happening we can't turn back now and yeah you just need to be like you know able to you know go with the flow and do it in a way that doesn't cause a lot of harm. Of course there are like a definition of open source software out there um, I always you know turn to OSI because you know um, they are kind of the you know the <laughs> kind of the, the, the points that we will point to and they check, you know, oh, what license and stuff. So, but um, I think, you know, open source by definition is of course like free and, uh, you know, uh, open software that the source code is available for people to um, use and to modify and to redistribute. But um, I think open source also in spirit is a community, it's a kind of sharing of knowledge. Because when you show things in the open, show it like you're not hiding any secrets and you are granting this knowledge to be shared um, by other people. So instead of in the past, you know, like, you know, only rich people will be able to go to the library and like buy books and all this, like, it's kind of the opposite. It kind of like makes information and knowledge open and available to a lot of people. Wherever you have like internet, you can, uh, you know, kind of obtain this knowledge. So. Um, I think open source by, by spirit is that, and also it involves the community um, because everybody do a bit and to contribute. So that's also the com uh, community spirit that's inside. So um, I think open source by definition and technically is very different from like open source uh, in spirit and also the community. So th there are two aspects of it and which is fascinating because most of us are kind of um, living in a capitalist uh, you know, society that you know, a lot of 
times when you're working in a organization, you have to make profit, and sometimes it becomes a competition, right? And there's a good side of competition, but there's also the the problem of if someone discovers something new, it may be um, or a company discovers something new, it may be their interest to make profit, so to not share this knowledge, right? So that's why we have those those you know um, trade secrets and stuff. But I think open source kind of um, kind of being a uh, kind of like the fish swimming against this current that um, we encourage collaboration. So it's kind of like everybody is growing together instead of, you know, um, fighting each other. Kind of that um, spirit. The number one uh, issues we have with open source project is um, resources. Uh, because it's open source, it's free, you know, first of all, it's free to use. Um, a lot of open source projects, they rely on volunteers. Um, there's not many like financial, there's basically no financial income for them. So again, it kind of rely a lot on donations, on company who feel that they are benefiting from these uh, libraries that they are willing to contribute back. Because there's not a buy-sell relationship. It's, again, it's like, it's really depending on whether um, company donates or individual donates. And, it's not a very stable source of income, and I know a lot of projects they are struggling, and open source maintainer they're struggling because, you know, when they, you know, they need to have a full time job because you know they are not paid by the project, and then when they have a full time job, they don't have that much time to contribute, and um, some some of them sacrifice the family, some of them sacrifice other things like um, personal like health or even you know bigger things to maintain the project and some of them are just doing it alone and like you know it's a single point of failure <laughs> so um yeah this is the biggest challenge and if company can you know please support the the the, the open source you know um library and the community that you're benefiting from i think you know as a company the easiest is to just you know give some money to them <laughs> Python is fully open source. Yes. The governance model is also um, it's not by a company or one person. We have a steering council who take care of the technical uh, direction of the whole thing. Anybody can write with a sponsor, like with the support of a maintainer, to write a PEP, which is the proposal of how the you know how the Python language that should go to which direction. You can propose something. Anybody can do that. So um, yeah, it's open. It's democratic. Uh, and Python is now one of the most popular language. And I think it kind of like, you know, kind of hit the top a few times in the GitHub survey of like, you know, open source projects and stuff. So it's very important. Also, Python is used in, well, without Python, I would say that we don't have that much like AI um, model that's developed because a lot of AI model, a lot of things that we enjoy today is actually, you know, is by a researcher who's using Python to build it. So Python even sent like, you know, robots to Mars, like help uh, with a lot of space, you know, uh, taking pictures of some, um, you know, uh, stars very far, you know, the, the, um, the tel uh, we have someone from working for the, um, the, the James uh, Telescope who gave a talk, a keynote at a Python conference, say that like Python is used a lot in the research. So. All this beautiful image of, if you remember a few years back, this image of a black hole that is taken with some, you know, with the help of Python. So, uh, yeah, Python is used like, you know, to drive AI, to drive, um, you know, a uh, lot of scientific research or even, you know, medical research. I have um, been to a conference that is actually uh, is doctors, they are learning Python because they want to use more AI tool to help them um, in their work. So, um, yeah. Oh, I think. When you work in open source projects, it's, you're working in the open. You can't get away with a lot of things. <laughs> um, because uh, let's say, you know, a, a lot of, you know, a junior developer, like we call it rookie mistake, is like you commit something that you shouldn't. <laughs> well, if it's in your private, you know, your, your company's private repository, only your colleague will see it. If it's in the open, everybody can see it. <laughs> and it can't be deleted. So, uh, well, T technically, yeah, you can, but it's really hard, really, really hard to delete things. So, um, yeah, so it require also require lots of um, discipline because uh, again, you can't get away with messy code or 
the dodgy practices, you have to try to make it right and also make it easy for anybody with any background to contribute. If it's within your company, you can just sit together and like, you know, someone will show someone how to do it and, you know, but in the open, you you may not meet that person who contributed to your library. So how to make things resilient, that is, for example, you have to put in a lot of checks or all the formatting, um, you know, guidelines or checks is very important. Also, document everything, having a very clear contribution guide. So. Um, especially if you have a really com complicated project, like for example, like Pi Offre, it's kind of have a Rust, also have Python. So how to make sure like someone's setup is working properly, that needs really, really good documentation. Otherwise, you know, people just, you know, they can't even build your project and then they, they won't contribute if they can't do that. Yeah. That's I think I get a lot of help uh, from the community. I. Um, you know, I remember when I just started my first um, pull request. So it's like that's the that's the thing you do when you contribute. I made so many mistakes, and I got really, um, you know, uh, I, I learned so much because like I made a lot of mistake. I know it's very scary for people. It's like, oh, you make mistake and you're making it in the open, everybody can see it. But let's also kind of motivate you to learn, um, and then. Uh, as long as you get through it, and also people are very nice. A lot of um, open source projects, they would have a um, code of conduct. They would try to, you know, a lot of people, uh, professional, they would try to be uh, patient with you if they know that you are first time contributing. Um, they won't be, you know, <laughs> criticizing you too much. Uh, of course, there's, you know, sometimes it's not always true, but I think most of my experience is very nice. Like people are very genuinely want to help and give you guidance. Um, so that's how I get started. Uh, if you want to start an open source project, I think the best way is, is to um, talk to someone, to, to collaborate, to go to go to a meetup, go to meet someone, and you know, because um, I think the worst part of doing open source project, um, you know, the, the worst practice to do open source project is to do it on your own. <laughs> you want people to contribute. I have met so many like very very smart and talented maintainer. They they, of course, they can do everything. Like, they they are very smart, but they would love to have people to contribute. They go to this, um, you know, event called Sprints. They put a lot of effort in teaching people how to contribute to their library, because they know community is very important for the success of their library. And if you just do it by yourself, it's fine. It could be, you know, less scary because sometimes, like teaching people, it, you you need a lot of patience to teach people and. You know, yeah, like, so sometimes this is an investment of like growing the community for your project is actually as important as um, the technical, you know, um, you know, capability of creating something. So.